right, here we are, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair, local realtor here with Sutton Group Ottawa. And I'm joined today with one of my absolute best friends, <laughs> Jessica Arsenal. How are you? Good, good. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Jessica is a director of... Marketing and culture. Yeah. There we go. There we go. It's a, it's a full, <laughs> full on sort of title. Uh, and it's um, this one was actually a recent update for your title. Last year. Last yes, year. yes. So when I first joined TAG, it was strictly in a marketing capacity. So mm -hmm. I joined as marketing manager and then, you know, how it goes slowly started to take on more throughout the business and, yeah. you know, lean into different strengths and got that, that ch title change and promotion to a director last year. Very nice. And for you that don't know Jessica, her and I can just never stop talking. <laughs> Very like true. we can go for a coffee. That coffee could last seven <laughs> hours. Easy, easy. Easily. <laughs> and then you join in with the with the other couple. It's just it's unreal. So let's unpack a little bit for folks that are watching about TAG HR. What is TAG HR? So we're a staffing agency based right here in Ottawa. We have been in business for over 30 years. We're hitting 34 this year, actually. Um, so originally, we were very focused on government procurement. Mm -hmm. Now we are doing a lot of work in the private sector, so helping a lot of different clients build out their teams, get the right talent, and, you know, take that difficult, difficult job off of their plate so that yeah. they can focus on making money. In your opinion, I mean, like, obviously, recruitment and hiring and firing, this is a process that goes to the beginning of time. You know, anytime that you wanted someone to do something, you got to look and see if the expertise are there and all of that. What does it cost an organization to, on average, to get somebody in? And I'm not talking financially but I'm talking from a time perspective. It's huge. It's really, really big. So, I mean, a lot of people will start with the post and pray kind of method for bringing somebody on board. And that comes with a huge, huge influx of applicants. So mm -hmm. just to start with that, the amount of time that you spend to actually, if you're doing a good job of combing through and actually matching the skills against what you're looking for, that in itself is a big arduous task. Then you've got coordinating the interviews, doing reference checks, Asking the right questions in the interviews, yeah. too. Like, I think not everybody is really in the know on how to draw things out of the candidate, learn, are they going to be a culture fit? Do they have, like, the hard skills that you're looking for? There are just so many considerations. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the time draw can be huge between how many members of your team are involved in that coordination, how many rounds of interviews do you want to have? So to work with a staffing company, you do take a lot of that initial burden off the plate. Of course, you're still going to interview the candidates, but you know that the candidates you meet with are fully vetted for all of those considerations. So I hear this a lot, and I'm, I've been approached before in my sort of old experience. I've been approached a lot by recruitment companies and what have you. And you get that sort of feeling from, uh, especially from the folks that are just kind of wanting to take the process in-house. Mm -hmm. You know, that internal dialogue that they have. What would you say to folks like that that are looking at sort of outsourcing it or keeping it in-house? We deal with that a lot. I find sometimes um, internal HR teams can feel a bit protective of, of their space, understandably so. But where we come at it, it's really from a partnership kind of angle. Mm -hmm. It doesn't replace an internal HR team, but it allows them to focus on other things, yeah. other aspects of their jobs. Like one of the most important parts when you're onboarding somebody, you need to make sure you have a full plan. You're checking in regularly. You're developing you know, a myriad of training opportunities for them. But how can you do that when you're also trying to hire other people? You're trying to maintain, like, say you have different HR processes that yeah. need to be managed. Maybe you have HR complaints. Where does the time come from? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I find a lot of the times, especially like when we're looking at that aspect of it, is you're specialized in that segment. It's mm -hmm. it's the hiring, the vetting, going through the interviews, going through the, the applications, the resumes, all of that. It, it's kind of like the same sort of mentality as, you know what, like if, if I'm going to make bread, I can make the bread or I can buy it from the bread maker. You know, it does it really well. Exactly. And then you can make the rest of the amazing meal. And it's that nice little complimentary component that yeah. just elevates everything. Yeah, like it's if I want analogy. that sort of nice, specific, fluffy Italian bread, I'm not going to go and try to make it. I'm, you could try. I'm not that good at it. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's a recipe for failure or success, mm -hmm. depending on how you look at it. This is the reason why folks go out and hire you know, Absolutely. agencies like yourselves. So what is that process entails like for example you know i'm a i'm a small mom pop shop and i don't necessarily want to do any sort of the hiring or training or anything like that what's 
that looking like as far as engaging tag? Mm -hmm. So what we would do is match them with one of our account managers. We have uh, a number of different AMs that specialize in different industries. So we mm -hmm. would match them based on industry, who has the best like hiring insights to give them the guidance that they need. Yeah. And from there, it's kind of like an information download to start, like learning about their culture, where are the gaps, what are the pain points? And then from there, we do kind of a, a download of that information internally to share with the recruiters. So we do our best to really understand why they're struggling and then develop a plan around that. We mm -hmm. also have a lot of different um, tech tools that we leverage, for example, like LinkedIn Talent Insights, gives you a really good scope of what the market is looking like within different industries. So you could know right away if that role is like very hard to, to hire, yeah. helps you set the expectations right away, and then have those tough discussions about like, what is your, your salary range? What kind of uh, expectations do you have for on-site versus remote, which is like, the number one consideration for people right oh, now. Especially, yeah, especially right after COVID, right? Yeah, everybody just, wants to be remote. 100%. For sure. And then, like, why would you want to go to the office if you, if you know you can do this from home? Yeah. And still be productive and all of that. I'm definitely a, a hybrid advocate. I mean, mm -hmm. it's my marketing side coming out there. I find that when, when our marketing team meets in person, we do it once a week, our meetings are so much better. Like, the creativity and the collaboration that comes out, it's everything. But it's not necessarily the same for every team. Yeah. And in your humble opinion, as far as uh, hiring, the hiring process goes, what's the most important thing when you're looking at a candidate? Like, what's the top tier sort of characteristics that you guys look for? It doesn't matter what the job is. What would that be? Some of our clients are very, very strict on like years of experience. Mm -hmm. So we work with a lot of law firms and they want to see, for example, a lawyer with a certain year of call. So sometimes that is like where we need to start that search to yeah. make sure we're fitting that that immediate need. But more than that, I think the number one thing is culture fit. And if you don't have that right away, like if you have um, a client who is very collaborative and they like to work together and have a lot of mentorship on the team, you're speaking to maybe a very talented candidate who is very individualistic and yeah. you can see you're that not they're, not, they're not going to fit that. in there. Exactly. Culture, I feel like it's probably the biggest sort of make or break when it comes to hiring. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds to be like the, the fair thing to say nowadays. Yeah. You're hiring for the culture. You're not necessarily hiring for the skills because you can teach those. Exactly. Skills can be learned. People are always upskilling, developing those skills. And we do try to tell our clients, don't be so firm with those. Um, I want to see five years of using this specific software. Yeah. Those aren't necessarily going to get you to the right person. Like you said, it's about the culture fit the attitude. Of course, they need to have the right kind of background to start mm -hmm. with, but you start to learn where you need to bend in order to get the person who is, you know, motivated and wants to work with the business. Yeah. So you've mentioned earlier that TAG has been predominantly government focused for the 30 plus years, mm -hmm. and now it's shifting a lot more towards a lot of, you know, private uh, companies and what have you. What sort of mix do you guys have today? And what sort of experience are you looking for? What sort of uh, background sort of skills are you looking for? Yeah, so we do still have quite a bit on the government side. We work with a lot of senior level consultants. So there that could be anything from a, a subject matter expert to a project manager to a software engineer. When it comes to private sector right now, we're pretty focused on finance, accounting, and legal. So feeling very comfortable in those areas. But as we look to grow, I'm definitely seeing more possibility with real estate construction. We've started to have a few clients coming in that way. And so I'm excited to keep on building that expertise. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I ask is because, you know, predominantly when I was working in government, like, you know, doing government contracts and stuff like that, that was one of the things that we've always looked for mm -hmm. in recruiting agencies. Um, each one is specialized in sort of a segment, for example, like some will do government plus you know, in your situation, finance and, and a few others. So that's one of the reasons why I asked that. When we're looking at the hiring process and we're looking at sort of outsourcing that to a company like TAG, what does that process look like the second that I say, okay, we're good to go now, we want to use you guys? What am so I expecting from you? First step, signing an agreement, getting that locked and loaded. And then uh, from there, we need, you know, the brief details of the job. So title, 
salary range, and then we do, like I said, that initial kind of download of the culture and like, yep. what are what are the pain points? Why have you struggled with this role? Have you tried to hire on your own? What happened there? Or is this kind of your first time going out? We do the first bit of details, and then we try to get new candidates for that client to see within 48 hours. So we do work on a pretty tight timeline, especially when you know, we're having a, a new relationship with a client. We want to show what we can deliver because Absolutely. we do have an excellent network of candidates. And in your opinion as well, too, what are some of the hurdles that you guys notice as far as working with internal HR? Like they've already given you the keys. They've already said, OK, you're now going ahead to hire. What are some of the sort of the snags that you see along the way? I would say sometimes not being quick enough. Um, so right now it's. It is changing a bit, but it's been a candidate's market. So they've been able to field numerous offers, leverage them against each yeah. other, and it happens like that. I think so, it's been like that for, I want to say, for the last like five, six years. Within the last two, I think it got yeah. and then even COVID more, really just more kind of, intense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're working with candidates that are moving that quickly, but you have clients who maybe aren't moving quickly, you've got a big disconnect, and yeah. you could lose out on talent from that perspective. So... I think the number one thing is uh, when there's too much red tape in the background, you need to go through maybe like six levels of approval to bring that team member on or offer, send out the, uh, the offer to them, you might lose them. And what have you seen as far as the shift? You, you have mentioned it's been sort of a candidate market. What are we seeing as far as the shift with that candidate market as far as uh, like, are we able to find talent? Are we not able to find talent? What does that look like? And is TAG looking at sort of external, meaning uh, foreign? So right now, I'd say we're definitely able to find the talent. Um, there are some roles that are a little bit, you know, very niche specific. It takes longer. Mm. But what I would say is that the candidates know that they are skilled and in demand. So as a result, they have more requests for when you do come to them with a certain kind of employment offer. So it could be maybe a very high salary that surprises the clients. It could be very firm expectations on how much they're going into the office, which, again, could not be in line with what certain clients are looking for. Yeah. So I think that's that's the biggest opportunity to kind of get organizations and candidates on the same page there. Yeah. I want to say, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong in saying this, but I feel like it's, it's the best time to be a candidate or the best time to be a, an employee in the last, like, maybe two or three years mm -hmm. because of that ability to be able to kind of pick and choose what you want to do, what you don't want to do. Um, and then also having that sort of tight market when it comes to candidates. Yeah, you can really advocate for yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. With that being said, if we go back to some of the roles that you guys have been able to fill, what had happened to make this happen successfully? I would say um, one of the first things is being quick. So it's a very competitive industry, as I'm sure you know. There are a lot of staffing agencies out there, and some of our clients will be working with multiple staffing agencies. So once we receive an order to work on, We've got to move fast. Um, so we're doing a lot of outreach. We are also always engaging with our candidates. So yeah. our top candidates, we actively know when they're available, what kind of organization they would be looking for. And that means we can go right away and get an answer from them quickly as to whether they're interested or not. So moving right away is definitely one of the top things. It's being a little agile, quick, and then kind of getting the candidate in front of the the hiring manager pretty quick mm -hmm. is, is really the key, I, I find. It's also like as a candidate, I mean, I've been a candidate for quite some time in, in different roles. Um, the more that I'm waiting, the more anxious I get, the more I don't necessarily want to take on the opportunity. So it just makes it a Fair. little bit easier as well, too. Yeah. If you're able to make that decision quick and then kind of show them, put them in front of the hiring manager quicker. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a very it quick, uh, quick paced industry. So yeah. I definitely appreciate from the candidate side. It's always so anxiety inducing to like have an application or a presentation of your profile out there and then have to wait to hear back. Yeah. When you said earlier about the hiring process and like the, the training and all of that, in your opinion, what's the most important thing as far as getting someone to start day one? As I don't, When I say it by this, is the, the experience that they're going through. Mm -hmm. How are you guys making it such a pleasant and comfortable experience to get them there? So when, they're, when we're kind of passing off to the client and they're ready for their first day, I would say it's definitely managing expectations, making sure that candidate and the client contact know what they're going into for day one. Do they have everything that they need to you know, open up their laptop and start the day if it's yeah. a remote kind of job? Um, when it comes to helping the clients manage their onboarding, we definitely recommend a variety of like touch points with different people. You want to see like 
new faces for that team member. You don't want to have them like one quick five minute hello and then they're locked into their laptop yeah. watching videos alone for like the whole work day following like several days throughout the week doing that kind of individual. It can be a little isolating and doesn't let you experience what your your new company culture is like. Mm-hmm. So definitely giving them opportunities to connect with multiple people, see some of the fun aspects of the business, but you've got to pair that with the individual learning and time for decompression. Because of your sort of expertise in, in hiring and training and then getting folks into places where they're supposed to go, you probably you know have a lot of more of a pull on the market when it comes to statistics and things like that. What do you think is the biggest sort of turnoff for employees having sort of causing that churn coming in and leaving coming in and leaving what is what would that be the biggest sort of like one of the biggest things that always comes down to money so the biggest time of year for us in terms of candidate influx is after bonus time oh wow so if people don't get the bonuses that they're expecting um it could be industry specific like i find uh, within the legal industry for example there's like a waves of where a lot of firms are offering bonuses and if people are unhappy then they start to open up that that mm-hmm. eye to looking around. So it's really just at the end of it is money is the root of all evil in a way. <laughs> <laughs> it does often come down to yeah. that. I mean, there are a lot of people who are driven by the softer aspects, the culture pieces yeah. and how they feel. Absolutely. And I think when you're you're looking for your next opportunity, that's one of the biggest driving pieces. But when they're deciding to leave, it often is the financial yeah. piece. I've heard this a while back as far as uh, when people quit, they don't necessarily quit the job, they quit the manager. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's fair. Um, somebody not giving the team their team what they need can have a huge impact. So if you're somebody who is not building up others, offering solutions, or encouraging them to find their solutions and giving them you know, a pathway to do that, mm-hmm. I, I can definitely understand why people wouldn't wouldn't feel like they can thrive in yeah. that kind of environment. And is some of your offering, and maybe maybe it is, maybe it's not, is some of your offering also include uh, sort of training those organizations on how to do hiring and training and all of that, or is that? I would say we, we've we done some of it. Part of our plans are to expand that HR advisory side of the business. Mm-hmm. There's definitely a lot of opportunity there. People are clients or potential clients who are more on the short staff side of things, they would definitely benefit from having that kind of coaching training come in. We do have a big partner network of, you know, other HR experts who specialize in that sort of thing. So I would love to develop that out more and have that be an additional service offering for sure. You're tapping into our future plans here. Fantastic. (laughs) I'm I'm glad to hear that we're just kind of seeing this coming. Um, I wanted to dig into a little bit more about your role specific Mm -hmm. at TAG. Tell me a little bit more, what does it entail, both on the marketing and the uh, other part of it as well, too? Wearing two hats means my day looks different every single day. Um, when I first came on, one of my biggest uh, like missions to, to tackle was the brand and like the visual elements. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure you can appreciate working with federal government. Maybe branding didn't need to be top of mind or the number one thing. Um, but as we started to move into private sector, we wanted to give that brand a refresh, kind of let the the outside look like what the inside values are. So yeah. first thing came in, did a big rebrand, worked with the executive team to see like what are our goals moving forward? What are the values? How do we how do we show up? Going asking all the tough questions right off the bat. And yeah, we worked with um, a couple external parties to do the the design, the updates. And then from there, I really wanted to see TAG out in the community more. So that was one of my my second prongs. And then after that, it was a new website to a company. So those were, I guess, for two years, like really big projects that kept me occupied. Since then, I've also been able to build out a bit of a marketing team. So now we've got a marketing coordinator. We've got a sales and marketing assistant. And together, we're just trying to, you know, bring in leads, engage with our audiences. We do a lot of email marketing, and that is primarily around education. Yeah. So trying to, you know, nudge the messaging that we want to share with our clients, you know, being more open about hybrid work, showing them where certain benchmark salaries are at. It's pretty fulsome. There's a lot going on there. Every day is very busy, um, and that includes, like, our, our email marketing, our social, going out to events in the community. So that's... And it's just the marketing side of things. And then people and culture, everything from developing internal processes, you know, working on things like an internal newsletter, doing our internal hiring. So it's it's a lot, but very fun. I like being able to kind of pivot between the different areas. So mm-hmm. more creative, more strategic, more analytical. 
in your opinion, when you say marketing, do you think marketing has a two front to it, internal and external, or is it just an external marketing? The internal marketing or kind of communications, building culture, it, it, they, they tie together. They really do. And I think you're, you're hitting on what brought me into the culture part of the business and that I really wanted to work on you know, sharing with the rest of the staff, what are the goals that we're working on from a marketing and why does that matter? You know, bringing everybody into the fold on what those goals are. And then that had me thinking a bit more like bird's eye view from that culture perspective. Yeah. And it was a very natural progression to see what more we could develop. And I kind of joke about it. Part of what I do is I try to make work suck less. So, you know, what fun elements can we add into it to bond as a team? What kind of learning opportunities can we have to elevate ourselves and show up in a better way folks that you're watching if you like what you see please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can get more and more uh, alerts about episodes like this and learn about businesses that are in the city of ottawa and learn that this city is fantastic it's not boring there's so much to do and there's so much to learn and uh, you find it here first thanks again appreciate it